Ma'am, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, June 17th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and review those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's equity committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Carroll, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Makita Scott. Present. Dr. Aaron Hager. Present. Ms. Cheryl Pastor. Present. Ms. Lisa Mack. Present. Are there any um, other board members that are on the call as well? Josh Mahamza here. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Carroll, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Mary Boswell McComas. Present. Dr. Miriam Yarborough. Present. Dr. Candace Logan Washington. Present. Ms. Heather Lagerman. Present. Mr. Douglas Handy. Present. Are there any other staff members on the call? Yes, Executive Director, Dr. Adrian Morrow. Principal Maria Ramos from Hillcrest. Okay, thank you for that. All right, so, um, we have staff, we have board members, and it looks like the first item is the approval of the 2021-2022 equity committee dates. And um, do we have um, staff presenting those dates? So I know traditionally um, these meetings have been the third Thursday in each month. Um, I wanted to ask the committee, if, are you amenable for to having those dates remain the third Thursday at each of each month remaining at 4 p.m. as a start time? I am. Um, are there any objections or any feedback from committee members? Um, Ms. Scott, I'm, I'm happy for us to stay at that time and know that we move curriculum to two o'clock so that we won't be right on you on equity. Yeah, I was going to ask because quite a few of you are on um, why all of you are on curriculum, so I didn't know how that was coming from yes. one. We, to we, we changed our time by half an hour, so it gives us a little bit more wiggle room between the meetings. Okay, great. And I saw Ms. Matt said she's um, amenable. Great. All right, thank you. Any discussion? Any other questions? And Dr. Hager too. <laughs> Great. Okay, it looks like there is a question from Mr. Mahamza. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, when is the latest, I don't know if 
Madam Chair, you know this, or maybe staff member president might know this, but when is the latest uh, a committee could start? Is there a cap on time? I don't believe there is. They can um, usually we try to keep them like during the work day because staff have to um, support it, but um, I don't know that there's like a, a, a cap time. It's the latest they can start. OK, so like hypothetically, if curriculum would run over a little bit. Um, would that would they like table that or that's completely at their discretion? That's at the committee's discretion. Mm -hmm. All right, that was my only question. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Great, all right. Thank you for that. Um, next is a panel discussion and the panel members are Dr. Logan Washington, um, Mr. Mahomza, Ms. Warfell, Ms. Thomas, Ms. Dillard, Ms. DeVulture, Ms. Ramos, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Morrow. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome our BCPS students to the Board of Education Equity Committee meeting this evening. It is our hope to listen and learn from their experiences this year in school and perspectives as we seek our way forward to a more equitable school system. Next slide, please. Our student panelists will each answer one of these four questions and we kind of left the end um, number four open so they can share any perspectives or any new learning that they want the Board of Education Equity Committee to know as we seek our way forward. The first question will be answered by Lauren followed by Samantha. The first question, and Lauren, are you here? Yes. All right, wonderful. The first question is what experience related to school has had the most impact on your life over the past year? Um, the most impacting event in this school year, particularly in Ms. Jean's class, her just being a teacher and her expressing herself has let many people in my class open up and be who they truly are. So what types of things that Miss did, Doc, I guess it's Dr. Jean Ann, um, teach you this year that helped, that impacted your experience? What types of things does she do? Well, besides her amazing teaching skills, She's always warm and welcoming to any student, no matter race or gender. Thank you so much. Samantha, same question. Wonderful, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm kind of going to stick with the same theme here. And I think that the, something that wasn't necessarily an isolated incident, um, or events that had the largest impact on me, um, but rather kind of a an environment that was fostered that had the, the largest impact on me was one of just so much understanding and empathy with my teachers at school. Um, I feel very lucky to have had teachers who have been incredibly, incredibly understanding and willing to extend grace um, to their students this year, especially considering our circumstances whether that be checking in on us before class, um, you know, kind of having moments for us to just pause and really evaluate how we're doing um, with looming deadlines when we're, you know, when we were at home and uh, before the hybrid option was, was made available to us. And I think that that had just been so important, especially virtually, because, you know, it, it, it was hard enough finding some of that motivation to come to class, um, let alone if, if there would be no sort of personable interaction. And I just really, really um, think that the, the grace and empathy and welcoming environment that my teachers were able to cultivate virtually really did make my, my experience in school this year. Wonderful, thank you. We're gonna move to the second question. And this question is for Thomas, followed by Josh. What is your perspective or what do you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion in Baltimore County Public Schools? Thomas? 
Thank you for letting me speak about diversity, equity, and inclusion in my school, Hillcrest Elementary. I feel that the curriculum talks about people from different races, genders, and cultures through ELA stories. My classes seem to have a lot of different kids with different origins too. I thought that my class has had a good number of black kids, brown kids, and white kids. However, my mom told me that our school is about 40% non-white students. If that's true, then my class doesn't have as many non-white students as I think it should have. I like having diversity in my class. There are a few problems I noticed about equity related to the equal access to the education at my school. When the internet started going haywire at school, the virtual kids could access all the works easily. But the kids inside school got different lessons because they couldn't access Schoology. I see that a lot of my classmates have computer issues even now. I don't normally have them because I'm virtual, but kids in the classroom sometimes have a lot of issues at one time. My teacher doesn't always know how to fix these problems. So a lot of the time you can just restart, but other times there's more to it. I think there are computer problems because the internet isn't working well and the bandwidth is insufficient. I'm worried that next year when everyone is back, hopefully not on wood, we will keep having these problems. This creates problems with equity because not every student can access the curriculum always. There are also equity issues related to third grade ELA curriculum. In my class, most of the students are very good readers. I don't know if other classes do this or not, but instead of doing the phonics lessons in the third grade curriculum, we read a novel. The phonics lessons in ELA are way too easy. We already covered phonics in first and second grade. My teacher is forced to make her own lessons instead of doing what's in the curriculum. I also used to get reading enrichment in kindergarten and in first grade with a few of my classmates. Now there's none of that. On the other hand, every third grader gets these ELA tests at the end of the units. These tests make us consider things that we haven't yet learned. And we need a lot of background knowledge in order to find an answer that suitably fits the question. My mom was a high school English teacher and she thought that many of her students wouldn't have been able to choose the correct answer from the given choices, so I don't think it's fair that third graders to be judged on these tests. I think if a school is equitable, it has a curriculum that is at the level of the students. But overall, the Hillcrest lessons are pretty good because my teachers improve what is already there in the curriculum. I think my school is great with inclusion. My teachers do a really good job of teaching people kindness and making sure everyone feels they belong to belong. To support this, I haven't experienced bullying at Hillcrest ever. Hillcrest is a good spot to look for diversity, equity, inclusion because there's a lot of it. Thanks again for letting me share my thoughts. Thank you, Thomas. Josh? Hello, committee members. Um, I guess my perspective is a little unique being a uh, board member this past year where uh, a lot of board members and a lot of committees focused on this very important issue. Uh, from the begin from when the equity committee was created last year uh, throughout the whole year and, and still now um, I've just got to learn a lot, a lot about our county and um, grow my, um, my knowledge and even some of the things that I knew before um, turned out to be not as correct or um, not exactly as how I saw, saw it put before uh, I guess my perspective is that what coming into the county I knew that Palmer BCPS was very diverse uh, with um, students from all uh, backgrounds and I believe it was a, a majority of students of color, uh, but coming on the board and being a representative for all students, uh, what I tended to see was um, a lot of those students of color, um, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds um, didn't reach out to me or other board members as much or um, didn't even know any of these positions existed and what we tended to see as board members is um, uh, parents mainly even students from um, certain uh, schools or certain um, communities and those tended to not have as many issues with equity and when we, we were having issues I mean when we were having conversations with about equity and, and um, making our schools more culturally responsive and um, closing uh, uh, the achievement gaps um, we didn't have those we didn't get to hear a lot from those groups and i thought that was a big concern it was really a cultural shock i, I would have thought um our county um 
had more had more students more families um, of those uh, demographics uh, reaching out more. Um, I, I think in general our, our diversity shows, uh, but I think what is more important is providing access um, to important resources like Thomas just said, and also just um, hearing from um, those family members, uh, those families. Thank you, Josh. So the third and final question is for Kristen. Kristen, what do you and your peers need to feel seen and supported as we strive to become a more equitable school system? Thank you. Um, I think there are really three things that all of our peers have stated that they need and that I think are needed in order to have a more equitable school system. And it begins with conversations. Uh, I recently ran a campaign to become the next student member of the board after Josh. And the entire time I was having conversations with the students across BCPS from Eastern Tech all the way to schools in the Western zone. And I really learned a lot about what we need in our school system. And these conversations were had with students who are the people that this Board of Education were created for, are the people that all board members are serving on the board. And so I think that for our school system, we really have to have conversations with students like this one, but even more so in the future, so that their voice and our voices are heard and, and what we believe is important can, can be accomplished. Now, that's kind of the first thing, conversations, but I think having some support systems in our school buildings are also extremely important, whether this is a student group organized around a certain religion that's ostracized in our society, or we have a um, LGBTQ plus GLSEN group in our schools where we're showing pride flags and having different uh, sorts of symbols for inclusivity and diversity and equity in our, in our buildings. That's what's really important for students to feel safe and for us to feel like we're approaching a more equitable school system. And another thing is providing opportunities to the students that aren't already in more affluent backgrounds or, or aren't really are already in positions of power and using their voice in schools. And this comes by like looking at which students are able to participate in maybe extracurricular activities and which of those aren't. Are there any accommodations met for students to have any sort of transportation after school if their parents aren't able to work? And so maybe thinking about ways to create new systems of transportation for students to be involved outside of just the classroom and have an equitable education that's more inclusive of just what, you're, what they're learning in each period, but also it was about like the application of, the, of what they're learning and, and different projects outside of the classroom. Um, and so those are like the three main things, conversations, having safe spaces, and creating opportunities for students that would really make our school system more equitable. Thank you, Kristen. And um, number four is additional comments. I'm going to come to each member of um, the panel and request that you make an additional comment or you can pass. Is there anything you would want to say to our Board of Education Equity Committee? We set out this time to hear from you. So I'm going to go back to Lauren. Lauren, is there anything additional you want to share about making our school system more equitable? Um, yes, of course. Um, like the previous person just said, LGBTQ centers, I know that is would help a lot, especially in Hillcrest Elementary, which is the school I am in now. There's people that can't really open up. And I and to the people I know, it's kind of hurtful that they can't express themselves or show themselves to anybody and they have to hide that side of them. Thank you. Samantha. Hi, thank you. I think one thing that I would say is that there's really a lot of work being done to promote equitable practices, diversity, and inclusion in our schools. But I think what is most important um, in the execution of, of those practices and decisions that are being made is that students know that they're happening and that they know that they're happening for them. And I think a lot of times when students think about the Board of Education, they think about adults around the table doing really professional business things. Um, and, and while that may be true, I think sometimes it gets lost in translation that, yes, there, there's adults sitting around a table and one student member of the board who are making important business, businessy uh, professional decisions, but that they directly impact students' lives. 
And I think when we can encourage our students to understand more about the board's work and kind of bridge the gap between um, between our the you know the adults that are making decisions for us and students that sit at, at desks in our schools and online in classes virtually every day know um, the role of the of the board of education, uh, we'll be able to kind of open up a, a stronger dialogue. And I think that and as Christian had mentioned, conversations are key and they're crucial. And I think in in promoting that and perpetuating um, a community of, of conversation, we'll be able to better support students everywhere. Thank you. Thomas? Pass. Thank you. Josh? Yeah, all board members. Um, <clears throat> my uh, departing uh, words to you, especially members of this committee, is uh, I, I, I know uh, your work on the board in this committee is not an easy one. Um, I know from that fact uh, you guys uh, spend long hours um, reading through agendas, um, researching items that are going to be discussed, and reading, 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 reading the many, many emails that we all receive, and at times we don't even get to get get through them all. Um, and at times, an issue that I had um, were um, these spam email, not spam emails, but um, email campaigns uh, at times that occurred throughout the school year, depending on what issues it, it was. And I would say to you, um, a lot of families in our school system, a lot of students especially, um, don't have, I don't want to say don't have access, but uh, don't even know that your guys' role exists. Don't even know the power that you guys have to uh, affect meaningful change in their lives. And as you guys are um, looking at this data and um, just seeing the evidence that many of our teachers or equity professionals that are in this call have been talking about for years and years and see uh, and just seeing all that evidence of um, much needed change uh, being needed in our schools. Um, I would challenge you all to um, take the time, um, visit schools that you haven't visited, um, talk to families that you would not re not talk. I, I wouldn't say not talk to, but um, won't even have an opportunity to talk to. Um, these are families I'm talking about with either single parents or even uh, students without parents or students um, with, I know beginning in my term, I, had to, uh, I worked with our people, personnel workers about our homeless population, our um, uh, students where they didn't have uh, a stable family or a stable home. And so they didn't have an adequate representative for them. So re try to reach out to these groups um, because what you guys are doing is so important. And I know that in the coming year and uh, as, uh, uh, the board uh, resumes uh, the next fiscal year. Uh, you're going to uh, bring about bring about topics in this committee that are so important to the lives of our students. So um, just reach out to as many families as you could and learn and really learn. Um, I think I talked about to, uh, to many of you board members. I've personally shared my experiences, my experience visiting uh, different schools in our county, and I tried to visit every uh, every one of the three districts and just see and just hear from um, their experiences and how they see things and I, I i would challenge you all to probably try doing something like that in the future thank you and last but not least christian thank you i just want to say that i completely agree with everything that josh has just said and like i said before having those conversations and really getting to know the perspectives of those that aren't being represented is really important. Understanding what it is to be a low income student during the pandemic and really talking to those students, talking to their families to see what kind of hardships they're facing. I think that's paramount in any decision that a board member is making and that any leader is making in our society. And so I think that it's, it's super important for those conversations to be had, but, but not just to be had during months when you know we're claiming to need to spend special attention to them like right now we're in pride month and so uh, a lot of the conversation is about lgbtq plus youth but where is that conversation throughout the entirety of the year where is that conversation in october where are the conversations about black students and our black population when it's not in february during black history month within our classes 
the lack of education some of our students get for equitable purposes is so limited or it, it, the lack of education is so present because we're so limited to those months that are designated to a certain um, race or a certain gender to, to begin exploring that. So I think that we really need to always have that equitable lens for every situation and apply it to every single decision that's being made and every single impact it could have on a student. And I think that by making it a more, uh, but by focusing on more than just those months when we need to talk about equity and, and instead focusing and applying that equitable lens everywhere is necessary. Thank you, thank you so much. Again, I wanna thank you all for agreeing to participate in our panel tonight. I'm gonna open it up for questions from our Board of Education Equity Committee. First, I would just like to say um, thank you so much to um, um, the students, to teach to everyone who's come on here to share your experience with us, with your, your openness and your willingness to help us learn so that we can support you and um, support uh, children throughout BCPS. And um, I, I just want you all to know that it's what you're doing, you're sharing your experiences with us and what works, what has worked, what hasn't worked um, is, uh, it, it, there's no comparison to that. So thank you for that. Um, I, I, and I don't, I don't wanna monopolize the conversation. Um, I didn't know if any um, committee members have any questions of, of our young people. Oh, comment from Dr. Hager. Go ahead. Um, I echo your thanks to the students who participated. I'm a Christian. I can't wait to be, work with you this year um, and get to know you better. I'm really excited about that. Um, I, a few things that I took away that I hope that we can work on. Um, the concept of involvement kind of begets involvement and getting kids uh, involved early on so that those are the kids who have the loudest voices and can, can make the biggest change later on, um, I think can be a uh, something that we might be able to address potentially as a committee. Um, also, the fact that the loudest voices aren't truly representative of our student body and just trying to figure out how to kind of um, increase the volume of the voices that aren't often heard, I, again, is something we might be able to work on. Um, and then I was just thinking for the students on the, on the call, if, I don't know if they could answer this, but I know a lot of people do these school, school visits as, as board members and kind of walk around and see classrooms and things, but um, how receptive would students be to board members visiting clubs and kind of more student-centered uh, events? And maybe this is happening. I just haven't, I haven't been on the board during normal times yet, but, um, but what, is that something that students would want board members to do so that we can kind of get more connected with the students? If I may just jump in, this is Samantha. I, I think absolutely. Um, I, I don't think I could go up to the students in a single club at my school and ask them um, if they wouldn't want somebody who's sitting at a table helping to make crucial decisions about their education, get involved in, in and, and get involved in, but also be um, educated on and learn more about the things that they're so passionate about. I think that if presented with the opportunity, um, I know I know that many, many students would love to partake in, in something like that. Great, thank you. Um, can I answer as well? Yes, please. Okay, I would like to say, uh, Dr. Hager, I, I think that's an amazing idea. I think going to clubs is how we can approach students um, in the best way. I know that uh, I was talking to a few board members in the past and they talked about how they visited a cultural coalescence event at my school where students were exploring their own cultures and, and, and showing the diversity in BCPS and being able to really represent who they are and who they want to be in the future. And I think that's what would be so beneficial for board members to see. There are so many different clubs from political groups, ranging from Democrats to independents and, re and Republicans in our school system to groups about identity, whether those are uh, Muslim student associations or immigrant student associations within schools, and even just schools about service projects and, and working towards uh, technological advancements like robotics. Extracurricular activities are what can be pivotal in, in a student's education. And I think that um, that's the best way to get to really hear from students and, and learn what we're really passionate about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Um, may I share something? Yes, please. 
Um, I think it would be a excellent idea. This would give more people on the board to get to see what the students are interested in and what the students want, um, especially when it comes to extracurricular activities. Um, there's always, you know, in school, there's already like preset like after school activities or clubs, but sometimes that's not really what the students want. And I know it's been a big deal for some people in my class that want to play volleyball when they get in middle school, stuff like that, and it, there's no clubs for it. Thank you. Um, looks like we have a comment from Mrs. Pastor. Yes, um, first of all, thank, thank you, all of you. Um, it was very insightful because you covered a lot of territory and you covered the territory that we need to hear as board members and the adults, because sometimes we get stuck in the weeds and forget that you are uh, what it's all about. Uh, this last uh, piece that you just discussed about our being involved with activities, Joshua um, did a favor for me and I appreciate it. Um, the NAACP has adopted um, Northwest Academy and we are we meet with their students that in their clubs so each of us takes on, on this committee take on a couple of clubs and we go and talk to them or bring in other people and Joshua did the club that is about African students and that meant so much to them um, because they got to hear from someone um, from the continent and talking about making that transition. And, and, and it was wonderful for them and their various clubs being able to have folks go out and talk to them about what their now looks like and as well as what their futures look like. So that is something that we can do as opposed to um, just when we go to visit a school, just sort of walking through, nodding, et cetera, smiling, um, giving our students an opportunity. So that was a great suggestion, so thank you. Um, and just putting this together, Dr. Logan Washington, um, was, was just wonderful. Thank you for doing that. And I will say something else later about that, but thank you for doing this. You all were wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Pastor. Next, we have a comment from Ms. Lisa Mack. Um, yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, to Dr. Hager's point, first of all, let me thank the students. This was very, very insightful, and I appreciate the time and effort that went into it on staff's behalf and on the students' behalf. But to, Ms., to Dr. Hager's point, um, I have been lucky to have visited a lot of my schools many times and the, there are two things that stick out in my mind. Um, I was invited to Western Tech's Cultural Coalescence Day by Nicole Streets who was a teacher now and was a teacher when my kids were there and um, I wasn't escorted around. I just was dropped into the gym that had plastic on the floor and got to partic participate in anything that I wanted to participate and I soon found myself doing something where I was jumping between sticks that were being crashed on the floor. So I'm surprised that I didn't have a broken ankle. Um, I loved that day and I was really sorry with the pandemic, it was canceled. But I also had the opportunity to spend time with the students who um, were on the culture club at Catonsville High School. There was nobody in the room, it was just the students and me. And they were very, very candid with me. And a student told me that they were so empowered to solve problems that occurred in their schools that at one point a student was crying and this student who was on the club put his book bag down, sat in the hallway with the, the, the student who was crying, made some suggestions, finally got an adult in, involved, but the student who was on the club didn't have to answer to, you know, he didn't have to beg for permission. He just went into his classroom after that, explained what had happened and it was, it was no questions asked. He was fully supported in his effort to make a difference in the lives of that student who was having a very bad day. So 
I very much agree that when we go to schools, we should spend as much time with students as possible because just in those two visits, I learned a lot. So thank you for bringing that up. Great. <clears throat> thank you, board members, for sharing that. Um, that's one of the things I think um, that we all um, work to do is to not only attend schools, but to be a part of those schools and to be engaging with the teachers and um, also with the students and clubs. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. All right. Madam, Madam Chair, do I have your permission to dismiss our student leaders from the panel from the rest of the meeting? Absolutely, and thank you all so much. Good job, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much, so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your summer. Yes, have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. OK. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Logan Washington. You're so welcome. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, OK, so next we will have a discussion on the Board of Education's Equity Committee resolution. And for that, I guess, would that be you again? Um, Dr. Logan Washington? Yes, so at our May meeting, um, it was requested that we come up with a resolution um, to place in each school that really fortifies our beliefs as a committee around equity in Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, committee members were sent a draft this week to review, and I really need to give Dr. Hager um, a kudos because she really got me started really sharing something that her institution crafted to kind of shape their thinking around a resolution statement. So I want to make sure I give her kudos. That was really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Hager. It was a team effort, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Next slide, please. So on the screen is the draft resolution mm -hmm. it, for your discussion. OK, so I would ask, um, has anybody had any um, a chance to read it? Did anybody have any um, feedback or is shoot any emails over to Dr. Logan Washington? Um, because I can start off, I didn't have any changes to it, um, but I, what I was curious is that my idea or, or I thought our idea was that this would be on display at um, at kind of like at the front of all of, of all of our schools. So yes. I didn't know. Sorry, go ahead. No, I said yes. OK, great. So I didn't know. Um, as far as like um, if it was too much or if it was too short or like how that would translate into like what would it look like? Um, what came to mind is, you know, when you go to the mall and it says, you know, the rules of the mall and it's and it's listed like on a on it looks like a poster size. Is that what this would look like? Yeah, then may I speak on that, Ms. Scott? Because I, I think I was, yeah, for, the, for putting it there. When mm -hmm. I looked at it, the format um, I thought was a lot uh, because the point is to have folks look at it, embrace it. The words were good. There was some, some standout words um, and it just needed to be broken down so that it was sort of quick like you to what you're alluding when you go in the mall you get it it's quick mm -hmm. and folks understand immediately but there were some good catch words like, but i i was remiss i didn't send any of it my thoughts to dr float in washington but that was just my thinking um dr hager is it um the one that you sent over that you had is that on display in, in the front of um the places or is it something that's like in the office or how is it displayed? Um, it's on our website. <laughs> so okay. that, we just approved it um, uh, maybe two months ago. Um, one plan we have is to adapt a shortened version to potentially get included in everyone's syllabus um, just to kind of affirm um, that this is the, the perspective of the university mm -hmm. for all things, including each course. So each course syllabus would have a statement as well. Um, but for now, it, it's essentially on our website. But again, it's a fairly new, um, mm -hmm. newly approved document. So then maybe that's what we could do, because I, I like this resolution. 
Um, and I think that would be something good to have like on our websites and then maybe, you know, include in, in our, our handbooks or student handbooks or, um, or um, well, you all are curriculum, you know, deciding where, where we could also include it. Um, but also maybe having a shortened version, um, Dr. Logan Washington, that we could then display and put up at the front, like Mrs. Pastor said, um, uh, sort of like a our equity statement or um, our uh, um, or or something shortened that that we could then have on display at at the front because she can we can take Miss Scott some of these pieces like mm -hmm. policy zero one hundred a little larger mm -hmm. bold um, um, race special education those uh, the the, the the uh, font different or bold and or mm -hmm. different color, something that makes it pop out um, and do something with the way it's organized on the sheet. So each one sort of catches you just sort of like my hand is and um, then maybe just the word together. Um, listen, educate ourselves. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? Just pulling out those buzzwords so that anybody who walks in and now on the website, it could look different. It could look like more like it this. Have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm like thinking. Dr. Hacker said, they're going to have a shortened version as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you. Um, I did read this ahead of time. I'll, I'll be honest about that, but I'm reading it more critically now. And um, I, I agree that we, you know, can make a few changes. But I guess my question is, in the first sentence, is that a totally inclusive sentence um, where we talk about race, special education, status, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation? I, I guess, are we leaving anything out? It, I had actually lifted that statement directly from Policy 0100 okay. and its precepts, absolutely. OK, so it, it's not leaving anything out. I'm, I'm just trying to think if there's any student groups that we're not addressing. Um, even if policy 0100, if I know you copied it from 0100, I'm just trying to make sure it's as inclusive as possible. Uh, that's, and I, I, I'm just throwing it out there to see if there is any other group, um, especially for our student members who are on the um, call, are we missing anything? I didn't think so because it we we had um, race, special education, we have gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and then it even went into gender identity, including gender expression, English language, immigration, socioeconomic status. Um, I, I I I think it it, it covered everything. Um, so, and then the. English person in me, should there be the word and in the second paragraph that embodies diversity, comma, equity, comma, and inclusion? The second paragraph? Gr that's gr a grammatically sound correction. I just did not okay, want to. I just, I, again, it's, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Any other suggestions or changes? Um, this to me is fine for the website and and um, like you know putting in like either uh, the student handbook and the board handbook or um, um, some other places. Um, I would be curious to see what it could and what it would look like um, uh, on a larger like sort of poster size and so that we could put it at the front of all of our schools. Oh, um, um, Mr. Handy said we can, could we add religious beliefs? Is that in here? Let's see. That, that's what I was asking about and, and I didn't even realize it. Something, you know, that to make sure that we're not excluding anybody. Absolutely. So um, one of the things to think, just to think about when we look at religious beliefs, they're covered under the First Amendment. You can put them in your your statement, but they're they're very vivid in the First Amendment, which our kids come to school with those rights also. Hmm. It's just something to think about because really, when we were thinking about zero one hundred, that absolutely is something that we mitigate um, in our office departments in our schools. But we thought, you know, we thought about the co the coverage that the First Amendment gives students, teachers, and families. Okay. So it might be a Margaret Ann question. 
Okay, could you pose it to um, to Ms. Howie? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That would be great. Um, I was just making a few edits that I can send along too, but one way to shorten it would be to just specify policy 100 and then go on to say disparities are unacceptable. You know, in that way, um, if we modify policy 0100 to include other groups at some point, we don't need to modify the statement as well. Oh, good point. Yeah. That's a real good point because um, that goes back to the issue of the um, uh, religious beliefs. You can't say, as outlined in policy 0100, which states, and then you list this, and then you throw something in that is not a part of 0100. But if you say something that is more generic, mm -hmm. as um, Dr. Hager just said, as other things come up, they can be understood or added or whatever without you being it without it having to hang on zero one hundred. So. so it sounds like we're trying to be as specific yet generic as possible to make sure that we can create something um, that um, that can last and not have to be updated or changed each time the policy is updated or changed. Does that make sense? That's how how, how I see it. Mm -hmm. Ms. Scott, may I ask a question, please? Yes, is that Ms. Mack? Yes. Yes. Is mm -hmm. is it our intention to bring this to the full board with the um, recommended by the Equity Committee? That's what I thought we said last time that we were going to bring this to. We were going to draft the resolution here and then bring it to the full board to accept the Equity Committee's um, resolution for our because we have the Board of Education of Baltimore County on there. Uh, well, I'm I'm sure we did say that, but I have to be honest. I've had a lot going on. I so know. I know. I, <laughs> no we, worries. It was it was yesterday's thought. <laughs> yeah, the idea is to flesh it out here and then bring it so they can see what we've come up with and then also um, the, to then, you know, let them know that the, where we want it on the website. And I think I like that idea of like in the syllabus or in like the handbook and having it in there and then also um, having it on display at the front of our, all of our schools. So we would need this version and then like the shorter cleaned up version so that we could um, present them both to the board so they would um, see both. And then we would know at some point if we would be just stating policy 0100 without the specification and whether or not based on what Ms. Howie says, if we will make any reference to religious belief, which to what Ms. Pasteur said is not specifically in policy 0100. So yeah, that's a Margaret Ann question. So yeah, we will find out from her because if, if they are covered under the First Amendment, then, then that might be, she may say, you know, that we don't need to include it, so we'll see. And also, as Dr. Hager said, I think it was Dr. Hager, might have been you, Ms. Scott, that said as other things come up, because just remember, just a few years ago, um, pieces of this might not have been that is true. our policy, so we don't know what might come up, but um, uh, Ms. Howie can help us with wording it so that, uh, I think you said this, Ms. Scott, that we don't have to create, keep recreating and recreating. Exactly. Could I ask one more question, please? Mm -hmm. Where we have special education status, could we just say education status so that it is inclusive of all of our students? Dr. Logan Washington, is that how it's my, written? My oh, only question about that is how would, how do we, there's no, and Dr. Bosma McComas, can you help me with this one? But there's no classification um, between students that receive special education services and students that don't. Correct. Right, right but this is specifically saying English special learners. education students a status versus, you know, just by virtue of being a student in BCPS, you should have certain rights that you would not, um, there would be, you would not be treated differently for whatever your education status is. Right. You know, I think, um, Candace, this would be also part of our discussion with Margaret Ann Howie, Miss Howie, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I completely understand, like, we want to, our effort here is to be explicit, right, to leave nothing inferred, that we want to be upfront that um, we are committed to ensuring all of our, our diversity is 
is supported and included and and that we are committed fully to that. Um, I think it, you know, I think conferring with Margaret Ann would be probably our best um, our best advice here just on that and like the suggestion around religion, creed. Because um, I think it's, you know, it's it can be. I, I almost say almost endless, but um, mm -hmm. but at the same time we want to the point is to be explicit to not to not just take it for granted as well. So. OK. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And um. That'll be good, and then you can we can collaborate. I guess um, uh, once you have the um, information back from Miss Howie, and um, it looks like uh, Dr. Hager sent over some edits, and then we can put it together, and then um, take a look at it at our at our next meeting. But I think this is great. I mean, I think we're off to a great start. It looks like we're just you know fine tuning it now. Were there any other questions or or anything about that? No. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so it looks like next is a review of policies 0200, 4003, and 406. And now this is um, just with an equity lens, because um, that was one of the things I was hoping that we could, you know, start also looking at policies. And, you know, we do look at it in, in PRC, but because we're the equity committee, looking at it with a equitable lens to you know see if there's anything that we need to revisit or look at or, or bring to our attention is that dr logan washington again <laughs> yes so um attached to your packet for tonight's committee meetings were copies of the policies that you wanted to review as well as the equity lens questions that we ask so upon your review of policy 0200 do you see anything that um, is perpetuated in inequity? And really looking at and using those questions to guide us as we look through those policies are an essential tool. Mm -hmm. So we can start with the policy statement. Oh, I was looking at um, 0200. Oh, okay. 0, 200, uh -huh. Yep, the policy statement, mm -hmm. which outlines the board commitments. So that's the um because I have up uh, zero two hundred, which is the mm -hmm. first one we should click on. I see the equity lens on the screen. Yep. Okay, and then I have policy, policy. zero two hundred, yes. Okay, great. All right. This one is made us look into the right thing. Um and with that, that's kind of like what I was looking at. Um so at, any of those precepts or statements, um do they seek to to exacerbate inequities when you think about the questions. So when we look at that first pack paragraph, who are the underrepresented groups or really who is impacted by this particular item in the policy? Does this item ignore existing disparities or produce unintended consequences? So if in fact we file, we use this policy to letter, can we predict that any unintended consequences could arise? Mm -hmm. Or any disparities that we're ignoring? Because mm. when we even when we think about the discussion we just had, mm -hmm. religion, religion comes up all the time. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, um, I was, was kind of looking at like on 0 0200, I was thinking like H. I was like, you know, we believe that engaging parents, community members and business in the educational process is essential and has a direct link on student success. So um, that's general. Um, and so I'm just wondering if stating that could lead to maybe um, like you just said, religious beliefs, it, it, we don't have anything in there. I guess maybe community members or based on the conversation that we just had, you know, we don't say what community members or, or what churches or what businesses um, or, or maybe we, we don't say that. That's, I guess, sort of kind of like what I was thinking, like. Is a statement like that unintentionally maybe neglecting a certain community of people? That was just something that stood out for me. I don't know if there's anything with anyone else. 
Okay, if not, can we look at the next one? The only question I would have about um, H is the way, if you don't have those things, what would your outcomes be? And oh. how do we mitigate, and how do we really think about and mitigate if I don't have some of those things, will my outcomes be different than my peers or communities that don't have it? And how can we look at language, syntax, and interpretation to ensure that we're covering everything hmm. in the policy? It's just something to think about. Because I said, uh, where are you? Because it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Mamber. I can see this chart. Where are you? Because I couldn't see this on this screen. I had to look at it in board docs. Where are you so I can catch up, please? Oh, um, so if you're in board docs, um, I think um, the equity. We plan? believe that engaging pa parents. I'm sorry. Are you? I'm sorry. We're on item H. Okay. Yes, I know, and I'm, and I'm no, making I'm sure I'm reading the right thing. We believe that engaging parents, community members and business in the educational process is essential and has a direct link on student success. Am I in the right place? Yes, you are, yeah. Yes. Okay, so to Dr. Logan Washington's point, mm -hmm. she, I think the question she just asked all of us is, without these, with without any of these constructs being in place, would it have an impact on our students? Did I paraphrase that correctly, Dr. Yes, Logan did. Washington? Yes, you did. So I, we talked about this in the um, board goals about how important it, it is for us as a school system to do everything that we can to get parents or caregivers involved because the school system has a, you know, a child for how many hours a day, how many months a year. And I think there's a lot of literature that shows that when a student has an engaged person, whether it be a parent, caregiver, grandparent, involved in his or her life, that that student does have better outcomes. Um, so I, I don't know if, I mean, it is our belief that we should be engaging parents and our board goals say that we wanna work harder and have a process in place, but do we as an equity committee need to discuss it any further, I guess is my question, and take any further action? I don't believe so, but that's that's my belief based on the um, the equity lens, based on what the equity lens is and what I've reviewed here. I don't believe so, but that's why I wanted to bring it up to see what what others thought. Um, I, I just I'm worried about words and not actions. That's that's all. I mean, it is a very valid belief. I believe it. You believe it. We all believe it, but we need to do something about it. And maybe I'm conflating policy with something else but <laughs> okay and i'm just throwing that out there yeah no that's why we're that's what we're looking at that's what we're discussing it so we can start having these conversations and out of these conversations we will move towards doing something about it um dr hager um i'm i've, I've read this like four times and now i'm wondering if i'm if i'm off base by letter i um, which talks about clear standards and expectations for the delivery of instruction and support services, individual commitment and accountability and continuous improvement. The, where I'm hung up is it says for the board through performance management measures. My initial thought was that um, having you know standards and expectations are fine, but also acknowledging that not all classrooms and schools are going to be starting in the same place and that if we think about you know, growth metrics, if there's a school that's already at the top of the, you know, chart, then they don't have a lot of room to grow. Um, but also there will be schools that um, the growth metrics and the ideal targets would be different, but then it says for the board. So maybe then I'm, I'm incorrect in how I'm interpreting that part of the policy. And it sounds like Dr. Logan Washington was saying, based on the equity lens, um, what you just said, like if we don't do those things, could there be unintended consequences that could happen? Well, I was thinking the, the unintended consequence of setting all schools up with the same expectations oh. when they're all, all starting in the same place, I guess. But the, the way I got hung up is for the board. So is this for us or for schools, I guess? Oh, this is for um, this is for us. This is uh, precepts, beliefs and values of um, Baltimore County Public Schools. So it's for our commitment. But again, everything we do is for the school, so. Okay. 
Thank you for that. Yep, Dr. Logan Washington, we can go to the next one. Great. So the next policy, oh, that's I, that's the last item, correct? I'm sorry, J. J is the last. So we accept the responsibility. Mm -hmm. As serving as role models and preserving and enhancing these precepts, beliefs, and values of BCPS. That's J is the last one. Oh, I thought we were looking at policy 4003. Okay, so you all are good with two, 0, 0200. And we can move to the next one. I'm sorry, it was just one letter left, I thought. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I felt we were, okay. we were good with that. All right, so the next policy. Hopping around. So this one is about like recruitment and selection. And so um, I tried to, you know, was thinking of ones that were vast and different so that we could look at them with the equity lens to see, are there certain things that we need to look at from an equity committee that, um, you know, we could make recommendations or um, if there was anything that, that immediately jumped out at anyone? And there, there may not be. Ms. Scott, may I, can I go back to 0200 for just one minute? Cause I, it's, oh, yeah. we say the word parents, but I think, I think we should not just say the word parents because many children don't have parents. Can we, in all of our policies, look at saying parents, caregivers, um, uh, you know, something that's more inclusive than parents. Mm. So instead of parents, okay, yeah, that's a good one because everyone doesn't have um, parents. caregivers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a, okay. Thank you, Dr. Hager. I couldn't, I wasn't sure if we have a whole litany of things or just have a word that could um, represent the group of people to whom or who care for our students. Mm hmm. Yes, I think that's a great addition. Uh, Washington knows this. We've always we've used the word guardian because you can be an educational guardian and not be per se the care. Mm -hmm. So that's why in the past the system has used parents and guardians. And you could throw in, I guess, parents, guardians, and caretakers because a guardian is not necessarily the same as the caretaker when you're talking about education. Mrs. Scott, this is uh, Mr. Corns. I don't mean to interject in the meeting. Um, one of the um, one of the pieces that I might ask uh, as well is in the definitions that are provided in most of our policies and rules, um, the term parent uh, appears across almost every one of our our policies and rules and the definition is an inclusive statement around all of the individuals that you've listed. So that's uh, the methodology by which BCPS has defined parent. Um, I don't know if that helps or sell you to the conversation, but it is defined in that way. That is helpful. So parents, I, I want to just say this on what Mr. Corns just said. Mm -hmm. That is true in terms of the policy, um, but at some point somewhere as we are wrapping around that policy and doing what we're doing, just for the sake of clarity for parents and others, um, other stakeholders, we we do have to make sure that they they understand that, that they understand what that encompasses because most people have a very clear thought and vision about what parents mean. And that's why, uh, so I guess maybe it has changed, but, in my old days here in, in the county, we always said when we were writing letters and doing things, we said parents and guardians. So I'm just saying we need mm -hmm. to be clear about everyone. We want to be inclusive in terms of making sure everybody understands what yeah, well, that's a good, that's Those yeah. are very good points. And um, Lisa, I'm glad you looked because it's it's not necessarily that we'll see like big sweeping, you know, changes with parents. Sometimes it's like what you just said, a word, parents. Well, and, I work with kids in foster care and they don't have parents who are making educational decisions for them. So um, we're using in, fact, in that case, D, and, and, and the, when kids are in foster care, they, they are it's they're legally under the auspices of Department of Social Services. That's mm -hmm. who makes educational decisions for them. 
Mm -hmm. And I think if it's not that a child's going to read a policy, but we want kids to be more involved. And if they keep saying parent, 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 even the Mr. Corn um, point that a parent means a guardian, a caregiver, they're very sensitive to the fact that they don't have parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I and see. they're making decisions for them. Let me say that they do have parents, but at that point in their lives, they do not have parents who are making decisions for them. They're a, they're a ward of the state and the and through DSS, DSS has limited guardianship over them. So that's all. Okay, so that but is something. Dr. Hager put that in the, in, the, in the policy. It may say guardians and all of those things under parent, but Ms. Mack is correct. When we are talking to children and their guardians and their caretakers, particularly about children, unless we, I understand we're in the policy, but the policy must also be able to be articulated to all of our stakeholder groups um, with integrity. And that means that we have to, at some point, use those other words to them. That's all I'm saying, and I think that's what Ms. Mack is saying. We cannot just unilaterally say parents because it yes. won't mean that. So it gets that at the question number two. Yep. Does it ignore existing disparities or produce unintended consequences? That's it. That's what yes. It yes. Yes. Excellent, um, Dr. Logan Washington. Exactly. That goes to that. Yes. Perfect. That was a good and point. When, can I also speak to question number three on um, any policy or all of these policies? Um, can, uh, excuse me, one second. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did I feed the dog? <laughs> um, Unexpected consequence. Yes, thank you. So do, and I don't even know if this is here, but do we, should we have a policy, a practice policy, whatever you want to call it, that solicits input from our community community members? I know we all get, as as Josh said earlier, tons of emails, but we don't have a feedback mechanism to let the people know that they've been heard, that it's an issue that we consider important, and that we will indeed take some action or will refer it to somebody. I mean, do our policies, if we want to talk about partnering with the people who are important in our students' lives, should our policies reflect our commitment to that? So and we, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, we do have a policy for, um, and I don't know it offhand, but for like community outreach and community engagement, I know that we did just recently um, talk about that. Um, I don't know that policy number offhand to look it up, but that's where that would be in there showing, you know, how we how we engage, what we do to engage. Um, but it sounds like what you're talking about would be more like um, ways in which the system engages in their communications, outreach and things like that. That would be more like in the operations, how the um, the system would then take the policy and put that into action. So, um, but I think as far as like responding to the community and, and being responsive and things like that, that is something that, you know, we can help work on and, and, and work jointly um, with Dr. Williams on, you know, ways that we can further communicate. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a policy we could look at, but what, what we were trying to make, um, what I wanted to do here was like what you just did, using this and then looking at ways that unintentionally we are either excluding or causing unintended consequences that um, um, we are um, unaware of. So I think that's a good one. Parents and or caregivers or guardians and that's something we can do. I mean that wouldn't even be just this policy that how we phrase it in the language we could even translate to I think everything that we do all of our communications really. I agree. I mean, it's almost like in a Word document where you find and replace. Yeah. Almost, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So and that's something we could three. follow up with. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's, that's number three. Have I obtained alternative perspectives? That's why it's super important, you know, even when we're talking to children to ask them the name that they feel comfortable responding to even in a classroom. So just obtaining that alternative perspective. What do we as a collective community um, want to have identified in our policy documents that everyone has seen? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. 
So I know we're coming up on time. Um, do you all have uh, the other policy up 4003? And that's the recruitment and selection. So yeah. it's, it's not necessarily the policy itself, but again, is it is there any unintended consequence or any sort of language in there um, that comes out? And you know, maybe it's something that we you know can come back and revisit. Maybe we you know look at it multiple times. But I'm I'm just encouraged by how quickly um, you all were able to pick out certain things and connect it back to the equity lens. Because I know sometimes when I would read it, I would look at it and start reading it like for policy, but then thinking it, it's almost um, Dr. Logan Washington, it seems almost like as if you have to kind of retrain your mind <laughs> a little bit. And, and really asking the question, who's present and then really who's missing? Like what's missing? Because it's always, you know, when I'm looking at situations, documents, and even interacting with people, what is the missing perspective? that I'm not seeing that someone else might see. And I think collaboration around the ways that we look at policy and look at everything together to get those missing perspectives or solicit the missing perspective is essential as we seek our way forward. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Scott, if I may, uh, Mr. Handy pointed out the, the um, religious concept earlier, but in this particular policy, it points out federal, state, and local and if you look at them, each one, you can see um, you can see some differences. There are some things that are not there. It's it's not unilateral across the board. And so when we're talking about hiring, if we move beyond just our baseline thinking, let's say in a system, and we start processing. Well, what is the state saying? What is the federal government saying? What we do, just like with curriculum, the other two on the curriculum committee, we start expanding who we're looking for. And Ms. Scott, you remember when we went to um, uh, equity meeting and we were talking about literature mm -hmm. and, and having people that look like the children. Mm -hmm. And that just kept growing, didn't it? What that list looks like just kept growing beyond the things that we just automatically think. It went beyond just saying black and brown people. What does that mean? And so I think that as we are processing hiring, that it's important if, it, because it's in that policy that mm -hmm. we actually are paying attention to those levels to make sure we are out there getting some people from one of the South, from the South Sea Islands and and you know you know what I'm saying because we have those children in our population and 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 it grows bigger than what we generally narrow it down to. Mm -hmm. It does, and I think that's that's important to um, make sure that you know that we're doing that and having having that discussion. So for me, immediately nothing jumps out. Um, I didn't know if there was anything that jumped off. Um, thank you, Ms. Pastor, for that, because that was um, very useful. I didn't know if any there was anything that um, came to anyone else's attention. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and finally, we have policy four zero zero six medical evaluations. Hmm. And so this one to me was interesting. I tried to pick ones that were different in areas to get us get our minds thinking. But um, for me, this one was interesting considering everything around COVID and what we've just gone through. And I was looking to try to see, is there anything in here that, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, that would um, bear um, using the equity lens that we would look at that um, would require our attention. I actually have a question about this one. Mm -hmm. um, as somebody who has managed large groups of people, um, it does it state anywhere that um, that we would apply this policy 
the same for all prospective employees? As I understand it, what we're saying in this policy is that before we hire some employees, we may ask for an independent medical evaluation. I thought that it was saying that there may be a, a situation where a medical evaluation may be warranted even if you're already an employee. Um, wait a minute. I was envisioning a situation where someone, you know, developed a chronic disease where they could no longer sit on the floor in circle time or something, you know, something that made it more difficult. I, I made that up. Something that made it difficult to do um, a job, you know, that, uh, I mean, that would clearly not preclude someone from teaching, but I was just trying to think of something off the top of my head. Yeah. I, I guess my question, um, and if, excuse the disruption, <laughs> uh, I guess my question is more around the fact that, you know, I guess it gets back to implicit bias that we may make presumptions about somebody or somebody in a schoolhouse may make presumptions because a person is severely overweight. He or she cannot get down on the rug. Is that what you just said, Dr. Hager? Well, I was, I was, I don't know. I was trying to pick, trying to think of something that it happens in a classroom. Um, yes. Um, more that, about it, like a, a physical in, injury of some sort, but, but it's true. So it, it would be hard to, because clearly there are accommodations for things like that. Yeah. I'm trying to think of an example I'm having. Right. And I guess that that's where I'm going is, are, do we have clearly defined rules, if you will, for at, at, at the phone company, and Ms. Scott, you may remember this, we had very clearly defined rules for when we could send somebody for an independent medical evaluation. Um, it says that here, it says inform employees of the circumstances for which a medical evaluation may be required and advise them of their responsibilities. So, um, right. so that's like the rule and procedures. Um, but I guess what we should be looking at is does this exclude any population or, or, uh, or cause any unintentional um, circumstances that or, or create any barriers to to anything or um it, it, unintentional unintentionally because some looking at it like with it with an with an equity lens no and i am looking at it with an equity lens from the perspective that if we have a preconceived notion about a population of people we may believe that those people represent a risk to the system for um having them on the job and they're going to miss a lot of time or because they're overweight, they can't do this job or because they're a woman, they can't do this job. I, I guess I'm trying to say that I, I think we, and, and maybe this is not the policy, but I hope that we have rules in place that say when we can implement sending somebody for a medical evaluation so such that if I'm your principal and I don't like you, I'm going to say because you're 50 pounds overweight, I'm going to send you for a medical evaluation when another principal would never think to do that or something. That's that's kind of where I'm going with it. I agree that the vagueness would open it up to, un, to unconscious biases or conscious biases potentially right. as well um, for lots of different populations. I can think of a few as well. Yeah. So you would say that this is a vague, it's vague. And it could right, be it's, it's, it could be open to anybody's interpretation. And I, I, I'm, and maybe the answer is there is a list of rules under which we can implement this policy. But without that, it's very arbitrary and it's left up to um, people who may not apply the process the same for mm -hmm. all populations. Because they bring in the unintended bias. Bring in exactly. They bring in their own implicit bias. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay. That's good discussion. Yeah. And see, those are those are the kinds of things. Because, um, and that's what where I where I, I hope we can be uh, a help to give that sort of um, perspective. So that we can, you know, help round out some things, because you know, policy there, it's it's policy, but you know, looking at it at, um, on the equity committee with an equitable lens, and then you know, offering um, suggestions. Okay, Dr. Logan Washington, I think this was the last one, right? Yes, yes, it was the last policy. Okay, next slide, Great. please.
Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Dr. Boswell McComas. Sorry, it took me a minute to get my <laughs> my mouse working uh, in the right direction. So um, thank you everyone um, for what a robust discussion. I love um, having you use the equity questions. The more we use them, the more uh, they just become our uh, habit and lens of thinking. So I just want to commend you all for that. Um, and I want to thank our student uh, members uh, for their rich voices as well today. And um, before we go on to set the um, agenda planning, uh, for our next meeting and of course sort of looking forward into next year. I'd like to take the opportunity first and foremost to thank Dr. Logan Washington for all of her uh, hard work and facilitation. Her skills are fantastic in helping us really have great um, um, robust conversation. But I also would like to take the opportunity to um, just introduce our new executive director of equity and cultural proficiency. Um, Mr. Doug Handy is with us this evening. Um, and Doug, I don't know if you want to say hello. Sure, <clears throat> sure I will. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, Chairwoman Scott, all the board members. Do you want us to say good evening? Um, also want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Logan Washington uh, for her facilitation of today's meeting and the leadership um, that she's exhibited uh, during her time as the um, acting executive director. So looking forward to uh, continuing to work with um, this committee going forward. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. McComas, and thank you, Chairwoman Scott and other board members. My pleasure. And on that, I'd also uh, like to take the opportunity to um, just welcome and introduce our new chief, uh, Dr. Miriam Yarbrough, is also uh, with us this evening. And I, I don't know if she would like to say anything or not, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't being remiss in introductions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be a part of this uh, meeting today and to listen and learn and look forward to our collaboration in the fall. Thank you. And and I too want to thank uh, Ms. Heather Lagerman for her outstanding work um, in the Division of Organizational Effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Yavrall, and thank you, Mr. Handy. So on that, uh, Ms. Scott and members of the committee, um, as always, we like to um, lay out our next agenda. Um, as you know, we do not traditionally have committee meetings in the month of July uh, so that people can uh, make sure they prioritize their summer and their family time. So um, at that, um, here are some of the topics uh, that we have um, uh, brought up um, in the past and we just like to know um, what how would you like to plan our August agenda and if there's any prioritization of these as we start to build out um, the schedule for next school year. Um, I would say well oh, one uh, Ms. Pastor had a comment. Go ahead Ms. Okay. Pastor. Thank you. I'm very quickly just picking piggybacking on what was said. I have to say that uh, Logan Washington doctor was one of my students. Yes, she was. OK, um, I was 10 and at the time, but she was one of my students. And so working with her in different capacities as she's come through the system, this is the area where I've been most proud and I, I thank her uh, for stepping in and giving us the myriad of things that um, we have asked of her on every level. So this is why what we do is so important because we can turn around and see our former students telling us what to do. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Pesher. I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, Dr. Logan Washington, for your support of um, our work and everything we've done on the committee. Thank you Absolutely. so much. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and I just, um, as I'm looking at topics for the discussion, one of the things I wanted to make sure that we had on there was our, um, you know, talking about the, um, the coalition that we're building um, yeah. of the community um, to give us um, to have the meetings and things like that. I wanted to make sure that we didn't lose sight of that and that we explored that because um, I thought we were putting together a timeline of when we were going to have that first meeting um, and then sort of coming up with the dynamics of how we were going to do it as far as was it going to be like a Zoom meeting or um, how we were going to do that, how we were going to have, who it was going to be comprised of. I think you had a list. It was mostly like our, our stakeholders, um, but giving us input so then we can get input on, like you said, the capital budget and things like that from the community, actually having their input and representatives from the schools. Um, I think you said there were, were equity leadership teams at almost all of our schools or, or a good amount of them, but um, I wanted that to be a, a topic of discussion and then actually coming up with a, a date for us to maybe have a first meeting with that group. Okay, great. We will make that our first agenda item in August. Great. Get that rolling. And Ms. Mack, you had a comment or question? Yeah. Yes, and I'm going to ask Ms. Pasteur to help me out here. Um, <laughs> I try to attend the GTCAC meetings as often as I can. Um, and I missed a really important one that talked about um, uh, outcomes for kids and like our new testing tool that we just approved the contract for COGAT. Uh -huh. But I, I believe, and you can help me too, Dr. McComas, I believe the law changed and it requires us to identify more students as gifted at, and at a younger age. And I think um, we should, as a... Um, as an equity committee, have um, Wade Kearns come and talk to us about the change in the law, um, how it's more inclusive of all students and the impact it could potentially have um, on increasing um, our marginalized, the, the number of marginalized students who are now tested earlier, found to be gifted and talented and the, tr the impact it would have on the trajectory of their lives. Um, I, I, it's a, I think it's a missing piece that we would all benefit from. And I, again, I saw bits and pieces of it, but I did not see that whole meeting. Okay, I, great. I, I agree. I agree. Okay. Okay. Great. So that that may take up an entire committee meeting. Those two, those two items. But if you want to go for a third thing, we could try. But um, it may be when I think about these two topics, it may be that that fills the. August time, you know, our okay. agenda. Yeah, and I like that we're able to really explore our agenda items and 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 thoroughly discuss them. So, um, so that is a good point. I know Dr. Hager, you had a comment. Um, I was just going to mention again how valuable the um, structured discussion was with the students at the beginning of this meeting today, um, and. And you don't need to answer this uh, publicly on the meeting, but I guess I'm curious about how heavy of a lift that was. Um, and if it was not as heavy as expected, um, if that could be something that uh, we bring to every other meeting or something like that. Um, but again, if it's a huge lot of work, you know, maybe we could do it in a different way with our advisory committee, like Ms. Scott said. But um, I just wanted to throw out there that I thought that was a really valuable piece of the meeting today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We love yeah, hearing cool students that we could do that with our advisory, but also, you know, in between as well. I think it's great. Okay. Ms. Scott, um, can I jump in? I'm on. Have you gotten down to me yet? I don't know. Yes, Ms. Pastor. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, this goes back to um, Ms. Max. Um, yes, I think it's a great idea to talk about the law, but what else came up is that when we look at our numbers for children who are gifted and talented, we count them based on whatever GT program they might be in. They might be in GT guitar playing, but we count them and we are not. So when they all get tested and they are looking at the and we are looking at those numbers and seeing how well they're doing, we are not always taking because they take all of the same test. So we're not really looking at 
whether they were excelling in the math or the reading, et cetera. And so one of the things that I asked or we talked or talked about is that and for this committee, we really do need to delve into what that means in terms of our students, how many of them are really in some of those language, math, sciences, et cetera, um, GT courses. Because if you look at the whole number with GT everything, you might get confused. And one of the students today, I think it was Thomas, who said, um, I thought I was in an inclusive school until I really looked at the numbers and I realized that I'm not. And mm -hmm. so I'd really like for us to start thinking about and have Wade when he comes in, talk about that, what our numbers really look like among our varied populations. That was a surprise for me. I don't know about you, Lisa, but I never. No, I, right. And that's kind of why I brought it up and and the fact that we are proactively going to be identifying more students instead of making assumptions about students. We're going to I, proactively identify them. And I, I just think it's important that number one, we're taking that step. And number two, we all understand how important it is. So yes, Cheryl, I totally agree with you. Okay, thank you for that. So that sounds like, um, um, Dr. McComb, sounds like we have like our agenda for our August meeting, um, yeah. but it sounds like with these other things, because th these are all um, very important, the Title I resources overview, the impact of COVID, especially COVID-19, um, the extended closure, you know, as we're returning back, I think that's going to be something important that we're going to have to revisit and see what, um, like based on the equity lens, what unintended consequences um, that we weren't anticipating or um, ha have have come about. And and I just, again, um, I just am looking forward to us keeping our finger on the pulse through through the group, through this committee, um, because I believe there's going to be things that we haven't thought of that are going to come up. So absolutely. Well, we and Ms. Scott, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ms. Oh, Scott, okay. we, we made, we got through nine, page nine of a 29 page presentation on some of the stuff that's going to happen as a result of the COVID-19. So there's some dovetail between the curriculum committee and equity as it applies to that fourth thing down. Yeah. Right. And, you know, we will definitely, you know, when we think about our August, our August meeting will occur just before school starts, but we can certainly um, identify then what we would like to have an update on in the September related to the impact of COVID and 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 returning, you know, um, to a more normalized context for everyone. And then we can, of course, continue that. Um, each month and say what we would like to touch base on the, the upcoming month. That would be great. Because mm -hmm. I, I genuinely think it will take us probably, you know, by the third week of school, you have a real sense of where things are. You know, the first week is all the excitement of just getting the logistics back in place and people remembering ring backpacks and lunch boxes and musical instruments and all of that. Um, and then really by that third week, you, you start to really get a sense of where things are. Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Thank you all so much for that. I definitely appreciate it. Um, any other discussion or any other questions? Great. I appreciate all of you. Thank you all so much for your time, for your discussion and follow up um, with staff and, and everything. So um, if there is no further business, then our meeting is adjourned. So thank you all so much. And have a wonderful July. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Have a great summer. See Take you.